Survival in the computer age means knowing how to use a personal computer both in the office and at home. The electronic office is here now. Computer programs such as word processing, spreadsheets, and databases are used every day in thousands of offices. In the home, a computer is becoming essential for jobs such as doing your taxes and so your children can learn personal computing. If you have an IBM PC or compatible computer, the starting point to computer literacy is MS-DOS. Our objective is to give newcomers to personal computing a working knowledge of MS-DOS so they can be productive as soon as possible. Fortunately, you don't need to be a technical wizard to use your computer. Here's what you'll learn. The first lesson is an overview of what MS-DOS is and how to start it. Next, you'll find out about MS-DOS commands and how to use them for tasks such as starting an application program. Then there will be information on how to use floppy disks. Following that is a discussion of the files which contain your data. Lesson 5 is a quick introduction to hard disk drives. Finally, I'll show you some special features to speed up your work. These skills are basic to using your IBM PC or compatible computer. We won't cover every nut and bolt, but we will stick to the features needed for a newcomer to be more productive quickly. Today I'm talking about version 3.3 of MS-DOS. If you have an older version, most of what's said still applies, but you may need to consult your user manuals on occasion. Our demonstrator computer is a PC compatible with dual floppy disk drives, a hard disk drive, and a printer. Of course, I assume you know how to connect the components of your computer how to care for the disk, and how the keyboard is laid out. In particular, your hardware must be properly installed and connected. The hard disk should be formatted and configured. If you're not sure about this, ask your dealer to do this for you. I'll explain the concepts, features, and commands of MS-DOS. While Diane demonstrates these things, I suggest you first view this tape in its entirety then review each lesson and try the demonstration shown in it. Together, we'll provide you computer literacy in an easy to learn way. On that note, Steve, it's time for the first lesson. Our first lesson describes what MS-DOS does for you and how to start it on your PC. We begin the lesson with an overview of its major functions. MS-DOS is one example of a class of computer programs called operating systems. An operating system supervises all activities inside your computer. It's the basic tool on your computer. For example, whenever you turn on the power, MS-DOS initializes all the electronic chips and components. It then accepts commands you type on the keyboard and carries them out. As it executes your commands, it coordinates data flow between various components, such as the memory, disk drives, and the printer. It also has facilities for managing the data on your disks. Finally, MS-DOS starts other programs, such as word processors, spreadsheets, and database managers. In case you're wondering, here's what the initials mean. MS is short for Microsoft, the maker of MS-DOS. The D stands for disk and means it works with disk drives. The OS is short for operating system. I'll use the abbreviation DOS from now on. There are two ways to start DOS, one when the computer is off and the other when the computer is on. When the computer's power is off, insert the DOS master disk in drive A, making sure the label is facing up and the oblong slot faces in. Close the disk drive door and power on the monitor, computer, and printer. Soon the disk drive begins working. DOS is being read from the disk into memory where it will reside. The monitor should then display some product information and the date prompt. DOS is asking you either to accept the date shown or type a new one. Diane will demonstrate how to enter a new date. Just type it in a month, day, year format using slashes or hyphens for separators. Then press the Enter key. 
Now DOS prompts you to accept the time shown or type a new one. The time must be typed in a 24-hour military format. Again, press the Enter key. Next, DOS's identification appears followed by the characters A and right arrow. These last two characters are called DOS prompt and mean that DOS is asking you what to do. This normal startup procedure is nicknamed a cold boot because it starts with the power off and because the technical name of the process is the bootstrap loader. By the way, the enter key might be called return key on your computer. The other startup procedure is used when the computer is on. Diane will show us how. Simultaneously, press the Alt, Control, and Delete keys. Then wait for the date prompt to appear and proceed as if it were a cold boot. This other procedure is called a system restart. Understandably, it's nicknamed a warm boot because the power is on. It should be used when you want to change system disks, which I'll explain in a later lesson. It's also used in those rare instances when your computer seems to lock up and doesn't respond. There's one caution when using a warm boot to recover from a system lockup. Be sure to wait long enough before doing it. Sometimes the computer takes a while to execute a command and you could lose data. Here's a quick summary of the first lesson. DOS is your computer's operating system. It's the supervisor of system activity. DOS is normally loaded from a disk by a cold boot or by a warm boot if you're changing system disks or the computer locks up. Now that DOS is up and running, let's make it do something for us. In this lesson, you'll find out how to give DOS commands. A command is simply an order for DOS to do something, like print a file or copy a disk. Here's a demonstration of a simple command. At the DOS prompt, I'm typing the word DIR and pressing Enter. This command shows a directory of files on disk drive A. The listing should look like this and overflow the screen. We can fix the overflow problem with an option. At the DOS prompt, Diane types DIR, a space, a forward slash, and a P, then enter. This gets us the page display option. The directory listings fill up the monitor and then pauses to give you enough time to view it. The directory has one line of information per file. The first column shows the file name. The second column shows the file extension. Next is the file size in bytes. Then come the date and the time the file was last modified. To continue with the next page, press any key. Obviously, this option is useful for disk with lots of files. Usually, commands have several options. So let's see another. At the DOS prompt, Diane types DIR, a space, a forward slash, and a W, then enter. This gets us the wide display option of the directory command. The display consists only of file names. It's convenient if you only want to know what files are on the disk without having their live stories. There's a fourth option to this command that's quite useful. After the command name, type a space, then a file name, and as always, the enter key. This option gets the directory for a specific file, in this case, command.com. This option is useful to find out whether a specific file exists. Now for one final option. For this demo, the second disk that comes with your DOS package goes into drive B. After the directory command name, we'll use the option B colon. This option gets a directory of files on another disk drive in this case the B drive. Commands and options must be typed in a particular format called a syntax. Each command has its own particular syntax as documented in the DOS user's manual. Even so, there is a generic syntax for commands which applies in most cases. Usually the command name comes first, followed by any options. The first option is the disk drive name, 
which consist of the drive letter and a colon. If there is no drive name, DOS assumes the command applies to files on the default disk drive. That's shown by the letter on the DOS prompt. The next option is the name of the file on which the command must do its work. Third comes the switches. These switches invoke special features, such as a page display of the directory command. Switch options consist of a forward slash and option letter. Finally, come any arguments to the command. These usually provide extra information needed by switches. Here's another note or two. DOS commands are separated into two types, internal and external. The internal commands are the most frequently used, so they reside in memory for speedy execution. External commands are infrequently used, so they reside on a disk and must be read into memory before they can be executed. DOS commands can be typed in either lower or upper case. Options are usually separated by at least one space unless the manual tells you otherwise. An exception is drive name and file name. They must be together when referring to a file that's not on the default drive. Commands aren't executed until the enter key is pressed. This allows you to change your mind. By the way, the user's reference manual has special symbols for defining command syntax. Be sure to learn these symbols. Knowing these basics, it's time to learn more simple commands. The command date causes the startup date prompt to appear. It's handy if you forget the date. Of course, the system date can be changed with this command, but most often you'll only press enter to continue on without changing it. To get the current time, just use the time command. This causes the startup time prompt to be displayed. Press enter to continue on without changing the system time. The clear screen command erases the entire monitor. This command is handy for reducing visual clutter. Now we need to briefly revisit the DOS prompt. Earlier I said the default disk drive is indicated by the letter in the DOS prompt. Whenever a command is typed without a drive name, DOS searches for the default drive for files. The default drive is changed by simply typing another drive name. For example, type B colon and press enter to default to the B drive. Type A colon and enter to restore the default to the A drive. The default drive should be the one having the files you work on most often. At some point, you'll want to run an application program such as a word processor. Let's see a demo of a simple text editor application called Edline which comes with the DOS master disk. The command line has the application name and the file name, scrap.txt. This starts the editor and creates a text file called scrap.txt. Note that an asterisk appears. This is Edline's prompt. It tells you that DOS has taken a back seat and you're interacting with Edline itself. Typing an I allows text to be input. I'll type a couple of lines of text. Each line is ended by pressing the enter key. To terminate input mode, the control and Z keys are pressed at the same time, followed by the enter key. Finally, an E is typed to exit the editor. The DOS prompt will reappear and the text file now exists on the default drive. Obviously, full-blown word processors are more complex, but the same syntax is used to start them. The program name is followed by the names of any drives and files needed, and finally by any switch options and arguments. Be sure to consult your user manual provided with the application program. Let's review the basics of DOS commands. A command is an order to your computer. It often has several options. The command must be typed in a certain way, known as its syntax. 
Commands work on files on the default drive unless otherwise indicated. An application program is started by using its name as a DOS command. It's time to find out some important things about disks. We'll describe basic disk commands, what system disks are, and a couple of handy utility commands. The memory inside the computer is volatile. Its contents vanish when the power is turned off. On the other hand, disks provide a non-volatile storage medium for important documents. A disk is like a magnetic filing cabinet because it contains many documents and folders. Before any disk can be used, it must be formatted. Data is stored on the disk surface in concentric circles called tracks. Each track is further divided into sectors. The formatting process creates the tracks and sectors. It also puts a skeleton directory on the disk. Finally, it checks the disk for defective spots and marks them so DOS won't use them. Formatting is a simple operation, as you'll see in this demo. With the DOS master disk in drive A, I'll type the command format, followed by the drive name B. A prompt appears to insert a blank, unformatted disk in drive B. After doing so, I'll press Enter to start the formatting. DOS lets you know it's working by displaying the head and cylinder count. These are technical names for disk side and track number. When done, a report appears showing the results. Another prompt appears in case you have more disks to format. Typing in and pressing enter terminates the command. Label this MS-DOS 3.3 working copy. Right now it's empty, but we'll put DOS on it in a little while. Here's an important caution. The format command will erase any data that's already on a disk. If you format a disk that has files on it, make sure you don't need them. The format command also has options to label a disk. Select the number of sectors per track and copy system files. The first two options will be explained now, and the system file option will be explained under the subject of system disks. Let's see the label option. Again, the command name has the drive name B, followed by a forward slash V. When prompted, Diane inserts another blank disk in drive B and presses enter. When formatting is done this time, DOS prompts for a volume label. This label is nothing more than a title which is recorded on the disk. Diane's using the name DOS 332 of 2. The volume label can be up to 11 characters long. We can skip formatting another disk. In a later demonstration, you'll see how to copy data onto it. Usually, DOS formats your floppy disk with nine sectors per track. However, you may need a different number of sectors for a special purpose. For example, you might have a high capacity five and a quarter inch disk drive in your computer, or a three and a half inch disk drive. Also, some older DOS systems used eight sectors per track. If you're exchanging disks with those systems, you need to handle this difference. These cases are handled with the switch options of the format command. The various sector options are described in your user's reference manual. We don't need to cover them further. An important basic disk operation is copying. The disk copy command does a track by track copy from one disk to another. This demo shows how to make a working copy of the DOS master with the disk copy command. The command has drive names A and B for options. The disk being copied is called the source disk and it's the first drive name in the command. The disk receiving the data is called the destination disk and it's the second drive name. Our source disk is already in drive A, so the DOS working copy goes in drive B, 
Remember, disk copy needs a formatted disk to receive the data. Press any key, such as the space bar, and wait. Disk copying takes many seconds. We don't need to copy another disk right now, so I'll terminate the command. Store the master disk in a safe place. Use the DOS working copy disk from now on. Test out the DOS copy by doing a warm boot. Remember, that's Control, Alt, and Delete. You should see the startup prompts. Proceed as if it's a normal boot up. Always make a working copy of any master disk before using it. This includes disks with application programs as well as DOS masters. Also, make backup copies of data disks. If a data disk is in daily use, I recommend backing it up at least once a day. Earlier, I mentioned something called system disks. A system disk contains certain important files known as system files. These hold the DOS core and all the DOS internal commands. They're needed to start up your computer. Only a system disk can be used to boot up the computer. The system file option of the format command makes a system disk. Now I'll demonstrate how. After the command name and drive name, use a slash s. I'll use another blank disk. After DOS formats the disk, it copies the system files to it. Again, I'll skip formatting another disk. This disk will be labeled System 1. Each new system disk must be tested. Use the warm boot and reply to the prompts. The DOS copy gets returned to Drive A. As you saw earlier, the complete DOS disk is very crowded because it contains system files and external commands. There's little room left for an application program and documents. On the other hand, a disk with an application program on it may also be crowded and not have much room for documents. So the normal software configuration for a dual floppy disk system has either the DOS disk or the application disk in drive A and a separate document disk in drive B. Most users like to make an application disk a system disk. When they format the working copy of the application disk, they use the system files option of the format command. Then they copy application programs from the application master disk to the working copy. This way they can start the computer with application disk and start the application right away. Sometimes, special hardware options or certain application programs need extra system files on a system disk. If so, the user manual for that hardware or software will list what has to be done. Here's a couple of commands which provide disk utility functions. The check disk command scans a disk for errors and optionally fixes them. Let's see a demonstration. The check disk command is abbreviated CHK. DSK and the drive name follows. It's now checking the disk in drive A for any errors such as bad sectors. When done, a report is displayed. As you see, this disk has no errors. The fix option is invoked with the slash F switch. In normal practice, this option is used on a disk only when errors are found. Check disks should be done occasionally on data disks which are used infrequently. Use it just before updating them. The label command will either add or change a label on a disk. Let's see this done to a DOS working copy. At the DOS prompt, Diane types the command followed by the drive name. A prompt appears for the new label. It can be up to 11 characters long. We're using DOS 331 of 2. We've seen a lot of information, so a brief recap is in order. A disk is a magnetic filing cabinet. Disks must be formatted before use. Make backup copies of important disks. System disks can be used to boot up the computer. 
the normal configuration is a DOS disk or an application system disk in drive A and a data disk in drive B. Most of the time you'll work on data stored on files, so this lesson explains how to use them. A disk file is the magnetic equivalent of a document. A file can be a letter, a spreadsheet, an address list, or even an application program. Each file has a unique identification made up according to certain rules. The first part is the file name. It can be up to eight characters long, it starts with an alphabetic character, and can contain alphanumeric characters. The second part of the ID is called the file name extension. It begins with a period and can be up to three characters long. It too can contain alphanumeric characters. Extensions classify files according to their use. Here's a list of often used extensions. Usually, applications automatically assign extensions, such as the last two items on this list. Certain names are reserved by DOS and shouldn't be used for file names or extensions. A list of these are in your reference manual. Of course, the directory command shows file names and extensions. Now that we can identify files, let's learn some basic file operations starting with the copy command. The disk system 1 goes in drive B. It'll be the scratch pad. The copy command needs two options. The first is drive name A plus file name scrap.txt and the second is drive name B plus file name scrap.txt. Note that the drive name and file name are not separated by spaces. This command copies the source file, that's the first option, to the destination file, which is the second option. A directory for B verifies that. That's how to copy a file, Steve. You can also make a copy on the same disk. The command copy drive B scrap.txt followed by drive B scrap.dupe makes a duplicate file with a different extension. A directory for drive B now shows two scrap files. There are shortcuts. If the source file is on the default drive, the drive name can be omitted, so these two commands are equivalent. Also, if you don't give a file name for the destination, the file name of the source will be used. Hence, these two commands are equivalent. The delete command erases files. For instance, the command del drive name b file name scrap.txt will delete the scrap text file on drive b. The directory shows its absence. Here's an important caution. Be sure you don't need a file before deleting it, especially if the disk isn't backed up. The rename command changes file names. Here the command ren is changing the file name scrap.txt to quick.txt. A directory on the former file name shows that it's gone. But a directory on the new file name shows the data is still present, but with the new name. DOS provides wildcard characters to work on a group of files with one command. They're very flexible and sometimes dangerous. The question mark wildcard allows any character to occupy a specific position in the file name. Here's the directory command with a file name of mo question mark question mark Dot exe. What you get is a directory of files on the default disk which have file names exactly four characters long, start with MO, and have an extension of exe. The question marks allow DOS to accept any character in the third or fourth position of the file name. 
The question mark is handy to find a group of files with similar names. For example, if these files existed on the default disk, they can be found with the directory command shown. The asterisk wildcard likewise allows any character in a specific position, but it also allows any character in any of the remaining positions. We'll need some examples. The directory command with file name s asterisk dot exe shows all files starting with s and having the extension exe on the default disk. The asterisk allowed DOS to accept only file names starting with an S regardless of how long the name was. Now for a variation, the file name asterisk.exe gets a directory of every file with an extension of exe on the default disk. In this case, the asterisk allowed DOS to accept any file name regardless of how long the name was. Wildcards can be used in almost any file name or extension. The command ren asterisk dot text asterisk dot doc changes the extension of any text file to doc. The command del drive name b asterisk dot dupe deletes every file with an extension of dupe from the disk drive in drive b. Now for one more example. The disk in drive A is replaced with the second DOS master disk. It must be labeled basic or utilities. The disk in B is replaced with the disk labeled MS-DOS 3.3 of 2. The command copy asterisk dot asterisk drive B copies every file from disk A to disk B. The wildcard designation asterisk dot asterisk refers to all files on a disk. This is an extremely important word of caution. If a delete command uses the double asterisk wildcard, all files on the disk will be deleted, which can really ruin your day. Before using a wildcard with delete, be sure you know what it's going to do. Files can be protected physically by using a tab. It's applied over the right protect notch of the disk jacket. Specific files can be protected with the attribute command. It makes a specific file read-only, which means the data cannot be changed accidentally. Before demonstrating this, Diane replaces the DOS working copy in drive A. The command name is a trib and has the option plus R and the file name quick.doc. The file is now read-only. That's verified by using the same command without the plus R option. The R in the display means read only. To see how effective this is, the line editor command won't even open this file. To change the file back to read write mode, the minus R option has to be used with the attribute command. At times, you may need to look at the contents of a file. Three different DOS commands let you do this. To display a text file on your monitor, use the type command. In this example, type is being used on the sample text file. For short files, this works well. Long files need different commands, as we'll see later. The type command is designed only for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, strange things may appear on your monitor. The more command also displays a text file on the monitor, but only one screen full at a time. It's great for large files. A simple example will show this. I'll use the command type plus the name of a long file created just for this demo. Then comes a vertical bar and the word more. The screen fills up with text. This time, however, DOS stopped when it filled the monitor. To continue, press any key. The more command also works with the output of other commands. For instance, when used with the directory command, we see our old friend, the directory listing of the default disk. 
This time, DOS stopped when it filled up the monitor, rather than scrolling to the end of the directory. The vertical bar is called a pipe and must precede the word more. More uses something called standard input. These subjects are more fully discussed in our advanced tape on MS-DOS. The more command is designed for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, weird things may appear on your monitor. The print command sends a text file to your printer using background processing. That means DOS puts the file in a queue and prints it as time permits while executing other commands. The default print queue size is 10 files. Let's try this on our scrap file. The printer must be powered on and must be online. The name of the file to be printed follows the command name. A prompt may appear to get the printer device name. That's usually PRN and it's already shown as the default. When enter is pressed, the file is queued for printing. The print command is designed for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, strange and weird things may be printed. Many options exist for the print command, but we don't need them for basic operation. It's time to review the major points about files. A disk file is the equivalent of a document. It has a name constructed according to specific rules. There are commands for copying, deleting, renaming, and protecting files. Wildcards allow you to work on a whole group of files with a single command. DOS also has commands to examine the contents of files created only with Edline or from console input. Files created with application programs must be printed by that application. Hard drives are faster and bigger than floppy disks. If your computer has a hard drive, this lesson will give you a brief introduction to hard drives. Do a directory command with the drive name C. That's the usual name for hard drives. If its directory has entries like this, the hard disk has already been set up by the dealer and you can continue with this lesson. Otherwise, skip this lesson and get some experienced help because the hard disk setup is more involved. To boot up from a hard disk, the drive A door must be open. Use either a warm boot or a cold boot. The hard disk starts working. And these familiar prompts appear. Enter the date and the time. The DOS prompt now shows the hard drive name. Finally, close the door if the floppy will be used. The hard disk usually has a tree-like structure of subdirectories. A subdirectory is like a file folder. It's a subdivision of the disk which holds files on a single subject. The typical software configuration for a hard disk has a root directory containing a few special DOS files, plus several subdirectories, one for each different application. Each application subdirectory has the application programs plus document files. In normal operation, documents are created and updated directly on the hard disk, then backed up onto floppy disks. Subdirectories are noted on the directory by the abbreviation DIR in angle brackets. For example, our hard disk has several subdirectories, including one named MS-DOS, which contains files from the DOS master disks, and one called Edline for the DOS line editor. To move around this structure, the change directory command is used. Diane will show us how. The change directory command is abbreviated CD. The option consists of a backslash and a subdirectory name. That command put us in the MS-DOS subdirectory. A directory command only shows the files in a specific subdirectory. Here's another example. Change directory to Edline. A directory command shows the DOS line editor and text documents here. They were created for this demo. If you ever forget what subdirectory you're in, just type the command CD only, and it'll display the subdirectory name. Once in a subdirectory, you run an application just by typing its name. The command Edline 
followed by the file name new.txt starts our familiar friend the line editor and creates a new text file. When you exit an application you're still in the same subdirectory. So the procedure for subdirectories is to change the subdirectory containing the application you want to run and type its name and options. To get back to the starting directory which is called the root directory the change directory command needs only a backslash. Backing up and restoring a hard disk presents a problem because of the capacity differences between floppy and hard disks. It would take many floppies and much time to completely back up an entire hard disk that's chock full of data. And now I'll give you a shortcut that can be used with a single subdirectory. It uses the backup and restore commands which are designed for hard disks. Make sure they exist in the MS-DOS subdirectory before trying this procedure. Prior to this demo, Diane copied these commands into the MS-DOS subdirectory from the second master disk in the DOS package. I also type this command. It tells DOS which subdirectory has backup and restore. The command name backup has two options. The drive name C, a backslash, and the subdirectory name and then the drive name B. This command will cause all files in the MS-DOS subdirectory to be backed up onto drive B. Formatted floppies are inserted as they are requested. Each one is marked with a sequence number. Otherwise, it might not be possible to restore files from them. Each file is listed as it's backed up, including its subdirectory name. Now for a couple of notes on backup. This shortcut erases any old files on the floppies so they can be reused for each backup. This shortcut only backs up the contents of a single subdirectory. Other backup options exist to get different variations. A restore command does reverse of a backup command. Usually, a restore is only done when important data has been lost. For example, you might have accidentally deleted a file, or a program may have gotten hung up and damaged the file you were working on. Also, on very rare occasions, the hardware might have malfunctioned and wiped out data on the hard disk. The following procedure restores a single file in a subdirectory. The restore command needs the name of a drive containing the floppies, that's B, and the drive name, subdirectory, and file name to be restored. We're restoring file mode.com to the MS-DOS subdirectory. Floppies are inserted as they are requested. It's very important they be inserted in the same order they were backed up. That's the demo, Steve. Note these items about restore. To restore all the files on a subdirectory, use the double asterisk wildcard for a file name. However, if any of those files have been updated since the last backup, those updates will be lost. Restore won't work on system files. These have to be restored with the sys command, or sys command. Since we're done demonstrating hard disk, the default drive should be changed back to A. If you have a hard disk, remember these points. Get some experienced help to set up the hard disk. A subdirectory tree structure is typically used on a hard disk. Documents are created on the hard disk and backed up to floppies. To run an application, change to the subdirectory containing it and type its name and options. Special backup and restore commands must be used with hard disks. In our final lesson, you'll learn some features and tricks on how to speed up your work. Many of these features are invoked by special keys or combinations of keys. When the control key is pressed simultaneously with other keys, it gives special commands to the computer. Recall those long directories which scrolled off the monitor faster than you could read them? The control S combination stops the scrolling. Simultaneously pressing Control and S during the scrolling halts it and allows the display to be examined. Pressing Control S again resumes scrolling. If Control and C are pressed while a command is working, 
they abort the command. For example, suppose a blank disk is inserted in drive B and the format command is typed. After it starts, pressing Control and C simultaneously stops the formatting. The Control C combination also aborts an application program. The Control P combination enables the printer echo feature. Anything displayed on the monitor is echoed to the printer. As an example, if Control P is typed and a directory command typed, the directory listing will be printed as well as displayed. To stop the printer echo, type control P again. The final control key combination is control Z. This is used as an end of input signal in certain cases. We've already seen it used to terminate input in the Edline editor. Certain keys have special editing functions to help speed typing commands. The last command is automatically stored in a place called a template. The special editing keys perform their editing functions on the contents of the template. A simple example is the function key F3. When pressed, it copies the characters in the template to the command line. It's an easy way to repeat a command with two keystrokes. Suppose the command type quick dot doc had just been entered. Pressing the F3 key causes the entire preceding command to appear on the command line. All you have to do is press enter to repeat the command. Function key F2 has a clever function called a copy up. When pressed, it copies characters from the template to the command line until it encounters a specific character which you type. To see how this works, suppose the command dir asterisk dot com had just been typed. Now suppose you want to get a directory of all files with an extension of exe. Pressing F2 and then C causes the previous command up to the letter C to appear on the monitor. By typing exe and enter the new directory is displayed. If you make a mistake and want to terminate the command line use the escape key and type a new command. Several other special editing keys are described in your reference manual. I suggest you experiment with them sometime and learn some clever keyboard tricks. I'll finish up this lesson with two other handy features. Occasionally, you may want to print the contents of the monitor but forgot to enable the printer echo. In that case, just use the print screen key. Hold the shift key then press the print screen key at the same time. Whatever is on the monitor gets printed. Now for a demo of how to create a text file from console input. The command syntax is copy con short dot txt. It tells DOS to copy text from the console into the named file. Each line is terminated with enter. After typing the last line, Control Z must be pressed to terminate input, and Enter must be pressed one more time. Remember, to start console input, use the command copy con with a file name, then enter the text and terminate it with Control Z and Enter. Our final lesson has a very brief summary. Control keys provide extra commands. Special editing keys speed up typing commands. Other features exist to help you use DOS. When you're ready to turn off the computer, make sure your last command is finished processing. If you're using an application program, make sure you exit from it first. The DOS prompt should be on the monitor. Remove all floppy disks then turn off the computer, monitor, and printer. So that about wraps it up. You now know enough about DOS to use it productively. Both Steve and I thank you for viewing this tape. And we invite you back for more computer literacy in an easy to learn way.